we talked about flow as being, I actually used the word proportional, but proportional or equal to, it's still the same concept, to delta P, which is your change in pressure over your resistance. And so we can use these components to regulate blood flow so that each organ and tissue are receiving the blood that it needs. The first method we're going to talk about for blood flow regulation is that autonomic pathway. The sensory nervous systems regulate cardiac output by affecting stroke volume, which is a function of um, contractility. And contractility is kind of a funny phrase. It refers to how strong the heart can contract, and it is directly related to how much calcium gets into the cytoplasm of the cell. So contract And in addition to the contractility, we're going to get an increase in or stroke volume based on my end diastolic volume. And lots of factors affect my end diastolic volume, including my venous return, the ventricle stretch that occurs, and um, how far those ventricle fibers stretch out and so forth. So if stroke volume goes up, my cardiac output goes up. But additionally, besides stroke volume, we have our heart rate, simple enough, and the sympathetic nervous system speeds that up. In the periphery, all of our arterioles in the periphery are um, that, uh, innervated, if you will, by sympathetic neurons. And so at all times, these sympathetic neurons are generating action potentials. And this will keep and maintain homeostasis, but um, if we need to alter these components, then what we do is we start creating more action potentials. When the action potentials are spread apart and s relatively slow, like shown here, um, I lost my train of thought. So strike that. I'm not going to start over just because I've lost it. Let's see, what was I going to say? Oh yes, I remember now. If they're far apart here, it actually causes vasodilation right? And then constriction would occur when the frequency of action potentials from the sympathetic neuron are high. And then last we have our release of epinephrine, which is our fight or flight molecule, and it is released into the bloodstream and will cause vasodilation in the skeletal muscles, constriction in the gastrointestinal tubes, uh, tract I should say, constriction in the skin. And so overall effect is to cause vasodilation. Then we can control blood flow on a local area through the release of paracrine signaling molecules. These are chemical messengers that are produced by the endothelial cells. So if we imagine this black line here is your endothelial cells. What goes on there is they start to release things into the cell environment, including nitric oxide, but um, also the bradykinin, the prostaglandin, or the endothelium. And what these molecules do is control the constriction or relaxation of the smooth muscles. Of all of these, I want you to know the nitric oxide the best. This is the gas that is used by dentists. It's known as laughing gas. These days there are better things on the market, but this product is still available and more importantly produced by our own tissue. And so this nitric oxide causes the vasodilation 
that um, will regulate f flow on a localized area. Now nitric oxide also is important because it is used in, as a medicine for those who've had heart attacks or strokes. So if they begin to notice, primarily heart attacks, but if they begin to notice the symptoms of a heart attack and they take one of these pills that gets converted into nitric oxide, um, then they might have a better chance of surviving that heart attack. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about for regulation of blood flow is this release of these metabolic factors here. And these should make sense as our working skeletal muscle goes through the crossbridge cycle is using up a tremendous amount of ATP. To replace that ATP, we have our creatine phosphate storage process. But again, that's only going to help out for a finite amount of time. So as oxygen decreases, what this does then is it stimulates the flow of blood to that area by causing vasodilation. Oxygen decrease and carbon dioxide increase goes hand in hand because the oxygen is used as that final electron acceptor in the um, in the uh, cellular respiration lecture. We talked about that. Um, and so we get this relationship here. Now the carbon dioxide will combine with water to produce acid. So actually carbonic acid is what it's called. And um, so consequently, as the increase in carbon dioxide increases, um, my pH is going to go down because we're releasing hydrogen ions into the cell. This last one is probably the hardest to understand why it works this way, but it really gets down to those pacemaker cells. And actually, it doesn't even have to be pacemaker cells. It could be any cell that has an action potential. You'll remember that during the falling phase of those action potentials, potassium is leaving the cell. And so this process of rapid release of potassium into the interstitial fluid and into the circulatory system may not be the right qualifier.